The Brooklyn Vegan Show is a podcast about music brought to you by the music blog and online record store Brooklyn Vegan. Make sure to subscribe to hear all of our upcoming episodes featuring interviews with musicians and more, and find us 24-7 at brooklynvegan.com, Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Hey, welcome to the new episode of the Brooklyn Vegan Show. I'm BV editor Andrew Sacker, and on today's episode, we're joined by Matt Pryor and Jim Suptic of the Get Up Kids in celebration of the 25th anniversary of their classic 1999 album, Something to Write Home About. To celebrate the anniversary, the Get Up Kids are playing the album in full on a tour with the Smoking Pokes, and they're also giving it a reissue on Polyvinyl. It comes out August 23rd digitally and September 20th physically, and it includes the original album remastered plus 12 rare or previously unreleased demos from the era, including Matt's original four-track acoustic demos of four songs from that era, and there's a 28-page full-color booklet. And we at Brooklyn Vegan actually have an exclusive violet and silver mix vinyl variant of the album. It kind of matches some of the coloring of the iconic album cover, and that's available in the online Brooklyn Vegan store, which we've also linked for you in the description of this episode. Something to Write Home About is one of my favorite albums of all time. I cannot say enough nice things about it. If you've never heard it, don't listen to this episode. Go listen to the album, then listen to this episode. It's just, it's it's a total classic. It's, <clears throat> it's influenced so much music, and it holds up so well today. I was just revisiting it before we recorded the episode, and it it's just a complete blast to listen to. I can't wait for this reissue. I can't wait to see him play it on the tour. It's going to be so much fun. And I had a great time talking to Matt and Jim about about this record, and I hope you enjoy our conversation. Before we get there, just a heads up that listeners of this podcast can get 30% off their first year's membership at DistroKid by signing up at distrokid.com slash VIP slash Brooklyn Vegan. In case you're unfamiliar, DistroKid is a service for musicians that allows you to easily upload your music to all major streaming platforms, including Spotify, Apple Music, and more. And it allows you to do automatic revenue splits so collaborators and co-writers can get paid too. Provides you with an artist page that links to your music on all streaming services. And it allows you to add lyrics, credits, liner notes, and more. And again, you can get 30% off your first year's membership by signing up at distrokid.com slash VIP slash Brooklyn Vegan. And we've also included that link in the description of this episode and you can click directly from there. And now, here's my conversation with Matt Pryor and Jim Subject. All right. Well, hey, Matt and Jim, welcome to the Brooklyn Vegan Podcast. Thanks for coming on the show. Thanks, Thanks for having us. Hey, wow, yeah. you owe me a Coke, Matt. <laughs> so obviously, we're here to talk about the 25th anniversary of something to write home about. So I thought just to build up some background information, I want to go a little back in time first and kind of get to the point where that album is made. So my first question is, being from Kansas City in the mid-90s, the Get Up Kids were at the right place at the right time to be part of what people now call Midwest emo. Uh, how did you first get involved with your local music scene? Uh, well, first we should probably specify that I think the term Midwest emo refers to a particular mathy guitar-based um, style of music from Chicago that we don't really play. Matt, and, ge geographically though we are located in the middle i know but and, just, and our music style is sort of emo so i know i know but it's, i'm it's i know what you're saying i'm like, glad uh, that you felt the need to contradict me in an interview the uh <laughs> i'm just saying that like the term has come to mean something else and it was just being a band from the midwest who is part of that scene mm -hmm. uh we just we grew up going to like all ages shows around kansas city and there were a couple of bands from this area like boys life and giants chair who were sort of um in a similar sort of genre and were kind of outside of what was considered like the mainstream you know punk music scene here which kind of tended more towards the uh mid 90s heavier kind of kind of stuff which uh we didn't really fit into so yeah we just kind of learned from some boys life especially we learned a lot from them i would think i think that answered the question so how did you kind of like first start to like you know find like i assume you were playing like diy shows at the beginning like how did you kind of start to find your footing and get involved and realize this was something you could do 
You know, Matt and I, we all met, I guess, play, playing in other punk bands. Uh, and then Matt and I joined a band. I'll give you the whole history here. Uh, yeah, I don't, I don't know. Matt, my brain's not working. I'm sorry. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so we all, we all met in high school. I mean, we all, so Jim and the Popes have known each other since they were little kids, and I met them, and we were in high school, and we were playing in, like, all-ages clubs and, and coffee shops and stuff around Kansas City, and then when we started playing together, uh, there, there weren't really a whole lot of options for us to play around town, but we had learned from um, kind of other bands in, in a similar sort of uh, scene and genre, that it was possible to like go, you know, we had to, we knew we had to go outside of Kansas city in order to do anything with what we were doing. So that's really kind of what we focused on. Kansas city was pretty much an all there was, you know, this, the DIY scene out of sort of necessity because it was de definitely a heavy 21 and over bar scene when we started. And uh, all of us weren't 21. So it's sort of like naturally lent, lent itself to do that. Uh, well, like we never then, really played a lot of bars. To answer your question, though, we didn't know what we were doing or that it would work. We were just young and and we 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 didn't really have any any real reason not to do it other than like school and school's kind of always going to be there. And so we just decided to kind of go for it. And it, it kind of, uh, you know was it it did okay like kind of early on um you know like it wasn't like rocket to success or anything but it was just sort of like we didn't go out and like bankrupt ourselves the first time we went on tour so we were you know 20 97 i was 20 years old when we went on tour the first time and so Bean burritos were like 59 yeah. cents so you could live on live on a five dollar per diem <laughs> yeah, we lived on five dollars a day and crashed on people's floors and booked all our shows ourselves. So it was just sort of it was honestly more of uh more of an adventure than a job at that point. Let's just say eating breakfast at Denny's was a big deal. It was a luxury. <laughs> that's that's when we felt like we were really starting to make it. Like Waffle moons over yeah, yeah, moons over Miami is when I really felt like I was going doing something with my life. So how did you start to kind of meet and befriend bands like Mineral, Bray, Jimmy Eat World? Uh, well, Jimmy Eat World we knew from the Boys Life guys because they had toured together. Uh, I think Mineral toured with Boys Life too, if that doesn't, I don't know. All, all of that was connected through Boys Life, Giants Chair, and kind yeah. of the, the all the guys that were just a little bit older than us who, who were uh, already, already doing it. Yeah. already doing it and we kind of looked up to them i remember when i was i was going to the kansas city art institute get up kids were a band but uh matt was in college rob was in college kind of not knowing what we want to do and jimmy world had played a show and a bunch of those guys uh crashed at all, all of our different apartments and i, I remember just thinking this, this is what i want to be doing i want to be traveling around with my buddies and and, and playing music and that's when we kind of all decided to to drop out of school and it was, uh, so, never look back. There was a guy named Paul Drake, who's a photographer, um, who was who basically he was a little he was a little older than us. And he he had a probably the biggest sense of wanderlust of anybody I've I've ever known. And he would just go on tour with bands just to go on tour. And then he would like connect, you know, us with other people. And it was just, a, you know, give us he gave us a bunch of phone numbers and stuff like that. And he took a lot of really great photos back in the day before we He's like the first like real photographer I think we ever really knew, but he was a big he was a big uh, uh, matchmaker as it were in that. Yeah, I mean his his photos are everywhere from the first Get Up Kids EP to uh, Static oh, Prevails Jimmy yeah. World record cover. Yeah. Did he what? do the Clarity photos? The photos on Clarity too? Uh, I'm not sure. Static. I don't remember. Anyway, yeah. Awesome. So uh, when you first started writing as a band, what were some of the biggest influences that you were channeling? Uh, Fugazi, Superchunk, Weezer, um, Arches of Loaf. Jimmy uh, World, for sure. Um, Boys Life, uh, Drive Like Jehu. You know, being from Kansas City, you know, it, 
in the punk scene, the West Coast definitely had a sound. The the East Coast definitely had a sound. And it's kind of true, like where we were from, it's sort of, we were kind of taking it all in. Like we liked Jawbreaker as much as we like Quicksand or something, you know, as it, it kind of being from KC sort of went, I don't know. We were just, we weren't just felt like so stuck in having to be one kind of thing. There was no scene. Sometimes we, was yeah. No, was we, no were scene like, we were creating a, a scene. Yeah. You wouldn't know it from listening to that stuff, but we were really into like the whole like kind of mid nineties discord catalog, um, like late eighties, early nineties, sort of, sort of like Fugazi, Hoover, um, all that kind of stuff. So Jawbox, Jawbox is a big one actually. So, yeah. I mean, I feel like that makes sense. Like, I feel like that stuff definitely helps set the stage for like the era we're talking about. And then obviously the get up kids also had like kind of a catchier melodic thing going on too, but I think you can hear like a little bit of the discord. Yeah. There's some, some weird chords. Probably yeah. more, probably more on our earlier stuff for sure. And we got a little more, a little more poppy. We were just talking about like, cause we're, you know, having to learn old songs again. And it's just kind of like, they don't necessarily follow traditional, you know, standard pop songwriting structure because we didn't know how to write standard pop songs because we listened to bands like that. <laughs> you know mm -hmm. what I mean? So it was just sort of, it was like kind of taking that influence of, of like quiet, loud and sort of weird things, but then also being really into bands like Weezer and the rentals and, and the cars and like wanting to have like a real like pop, you know, sensibility, but we didn't know how to write pop songs necessarily, except accidentally. Yeah. And I do think that comes through because even just like from my own experience, um, I mean, I first heard something to write home about probably a few years after it came out. And I had already known like Weezer, Green Day, Blink-182, like these kind of popular bands. And I remember being like, oh, this is kind of like those bands, but weirder. So it was like it came through in comparison, I think. When there's a there's an innocence when you're young and you really don't know what you're doing. Sometimes that's when in you when you get stuck in your ways, it can get boring, right? But when you, when you it's yeah. Well, you take it, it, it uh, weird it, stuff it, ma it makes it cooler in some ways, you know. And like the different influences of the different like band members, whereas like Jim and I both really like uh, like kind of like Screeching Weasel era, like pop punk. And then like Rob's favorite band is Unwound. So, I mean, somewhere in somewhere in between. <laughs> yeah. Um. So before we get to something right home about, I need to talk a little bit about Four Minute Mile. So from what I understand, nobody expected this album to take off the way it did. Uh, so what was your mindset as a band when you were writing and recording this one? And how did you react to when it did start getting a lot of attention? We didn't go out to write a record as for four minute mile as as opposed to something right home about where we were you know, you know they always say you have forever to write your first album mm -hmm. right is basically a live record i mean we just were a bunch of kids we had written a bunch of songs and those are the songs we had there wasn't there wasn't as much rhyme and rhyme you know, and reason to that one jim this came up in another yeah. interview that i did that i i started really thinking about it and i kind of think that like that that rule of like you have forever to write your first record and you have all this life experience to put into that first record doesn't really apply to us that much because we basically had never toured. We had barely lived at all. We recorded that record in two and a half days. And then we went on tour for two years and lived a lot and learned a lot and put all of that into our. our yeah, I, I agree with that. I don't think that's really what I meant though. Hmm. Well, I was just saying about the whole like there's that thing about how you have your whole life to to make your first record. And I think that implies that you have you put a lot of time into it. And we really didn't because that I mean, we had only been a band for like a year and a half when we made Four Minute Mile and we hadn't toured at all. Um, yeah, I think we'd only done a weekenders. few weekend shows. Like, we, like when we played with Mineral and Promise Ring in Madison, Wisconsin, had we recorded four minute mile? I don't think so. No, because that's when we did the that was the same weekend as that weird ass uh that Iowa show where the guy everyone was tripping. 
we could do an entire podcast just on that <laughs> show in Iowa. And that was a very <laughs> show. Anyway, uh, but the thing about both something you're home about and four minute mile is that like the success of the band was really gradual and it was like something, it wasn't like we were on the radio and all of a sudden, like, it wasn't like we were booked into like a 300 capacity room and had to bump it up to a thousand capacity room a month later. It was just like, we went from 300 and then there were 500 and then there were 700 and then there were a thousand, you know, like it all felt very like uh, gradual I'm, and comfortable. Uh, uh, yeah. Our, our biggest goal I mean, we recorded that. Ryan was still, a, he was in high school. We we snuck him out early on a Friday, drove up to Chicago. Uh, we were all still in college. And uh, our, I think our biggest goal was that we were going to go to Europe because uh, all the bands that were on Doghouse got to do that. So that was that was about as far as I was personally seen forward. So then when the album did take off the way it did, from what I understand, you had a lot of label interests, including from majors, uh, and ultimately ended up going with Vagrant. So can you kind of reflect on that period of label interest and why you ultimately chose Vagrant? Uh, well, Vagrant was sort of the, uh, the, the label of last resort because we did talk to a lot of major labels, but we never got really taken seriously by them, except for like, we would meet like an A&R guy really fall in love with the label really go like this guy really gets us and then more than once whenever he would bump it up to like the head of the label they'd be like okay this is just some baby band we'll give you guys like fifteen hundred dollars to make an I, album no. you know I, I we were gonna sign to sub pop like that was like the the contract was written and basically this all ties into vagrant i'll get their map uh, we we had signed a deal with Doghouse, right? And the deal was basically like a major label deal. And the deal, for better or worse, kind of sucked. But we knew it. We just wanted to be on a record label, wanted to go to Europe, and we and we signed the deal. So when we were getting courted by these labels, you know, Sub Pop, we thought, oh, there's still another indie label, but it's got major label distribution. I guess they were technically owned by major. And uh, we get their contract, and it's basically just the same contract, major label kind of a just a bad deal and uh that's kind of where vagrant came in we're looking at all these all these labels and the deals they're proposing and i guess that's just kind of how major label deals are structured that it's well heavily, we, right heavily favored for for the label and, and we were kind of presented, we didn't like it yeah we were kind of presented with either signing a bad deal on a major label or signing a really good deal with a tiny independent record label in Southern California. And so we decided to sign the smaller, better deal and it, it worked out. It's pretty wild, like just how different the public's view of Vagrant was when you signed versus like two or three years later. When oh, there wasn't, it... there wasn't a public view of yeah. Vagrant. <laughs> we basically, as Rich Egan, our former manager and owner of Vagrant Records said, you know, always bet on yourself. And that's kind of what we did uh, by signing with Vagrant. So when you go to make the record and like, I guess we already touched on this a little bit where like, you know, it, it had like, this was the time when like a band like Blink-182 got really fucking famous that same year, you know, like doing something not miles away. Um, so like this was the moment where like a band like the Get Up Kids could potentially be huge. Um, and maybe, I don't know if you would have went to a major and gotten the studio with jerry finn like it'd be a different conversation we're having now but obviously you didn't do that and like you made the record you made um were you like were you shooting for let's get this band on the radio let's be big like green day and weezer or whatever or were you like let's not do that let's like you know maybe take a smaller deal to have more control and make the record we want to make because we don't think we're going to even deliver like a pop record oh no it's, it's those well first of all those are two different things uh, well, first of all i want to say you were like so on the nose like one of the things that we were talking about if signing to major label and wanting Jerry Finn to produce our record, he had, he had just done head trip in every key by super mm -hmm. drag, which is still one of our band's all time favorite records. Uh, so yeah, anyway, I just thought that was funny that you <laughs> brought him up, but yes, go ahead, Matt. Oh, I was just going to say like the, the, you know, we weren't on the radio for lack of trying. 
I mean, we were trying to get on the radio, and the radio was like, "Uh, no, the kids want to listen to Limp Biscuit right now." Yeah, that's what was. And, that's what people don't remember. I, I've, I've been talking. We've been talking about this record a lot, so I feel like, mm. have I talked about this already? Am I saying the same things? But like K Rock in L A was Limp Biscuit and Corn. That like the fact that even like Blink One Eighty Two was getting played. That that was kind of a, well. A and I I, do, I wonder that if that was a, a bit of a like West Coast like. You know, like because some of those like punk pop punk bands like Face to Face and even The Offspring, I think, started off getting popular on like Los Angeles radio. And I think part of it was at least like a that was like us not being from the area maybe had something to do with us not really getting our foot in the door there. But like we had never had any reservations about trying to be a pop band and trying to be on the radio. We weren't trying to be punk by signing to this label. We were just we were signing the best deal we could get with the best record label we could find because we were so unhappy being on doghouse we one, of, one of the issues with doghouse back then and why one of the main reasons we wanted to switch labels is because uh we were growing faster than the label was and they just didn't have the distribution we were always hearing like kids couldn't find our our cds in in stores obviously that all changed later for doghouse but uh, at the time they were, I think the biggest record they had before 400 miles sold like 10,000 records. So, yeah. So let's talk a little more about writing the record. So, I mean, I, like you said, like that you had sort of barely lived band life for four minute mile and for going into this one, you, that was much different. And of course you can hear listening to it. Like there's so much different about it. There's like acoustic guitars and keyboards and, you know, like it makes all these different stylistic, sort of variations compared to the first one so like how did your approach with songwriting compare to four minute mile and like and tell me a little bit about like you know what was sort of pushing you in that direction to like expand the sound have you know a ballad and like stuff like that honestly whenever i think about this particular question i think it comes down to having time and a little bit more financial freedom to try and spend more than two and a half days in the studio actually uh, making demos for the first time doing doing pre-production for a week in LA uh and then also i mean we we there are there's a, a keyboards and piano on 4 minute mile and you know we were interested in a lot of like synth pop kind of stuff uh you know like that dog in the rentals as well as like kind of 80s like i said before the cars um and so you know, we we had toyed around with the idea of having a, a touring keyboard player. And then when we met James, uh, we were just like, well, this this seems to work. Uh, and so we took him with us to California. So we might as well put, you know, we had all these keyboards with us and a keyboard player. So we might as well put them on the record. And uh, but yeah, it was really a lot of it was just trying, you know, being able to try things, you know, like uh, I mean, four minute mile is is basically kind of a demo in a lot of ways because it's just very much like the first time i mean one of the songs was written in the studio because we needed filler you know what i mean like and so we you know we just had more time and, and more more freedom um and and no real label pressure honestly like no one at vagrant i don't think they ever even really heard the record till it was basically done so they certainly they didn't really i don't i don't remember them having much input do you no it was a wild time it, i we were there for like six weeks i I'd, I'd never lived outside of kansas city longer longer than a couple of weeks so it was it was exciting and no they pretty much let us do for better for worse whatever have kind of control of it all and that that was nice of them it's uh it's pretty fascinating listening to the demos that you're releasing on the new 25th anniversary edition and like hearing how some songs were like pretty much all there and others went through some pretty significant revisions. Uh, can you talk about that revision process for the one like I mean like you just put out the holiday demo and like even the lyrics are completely different. Yeah. Um, so to sort of reflect on that process of like having the song and then being like let's go back to the drawing board let's work on it. A lot of that was in pre-production. Like I remember uh, Chad, who Glenn, who produced that record, like he just came in and we kind of sat down with us. And yeah, I don't know. I, it was just the benefit of recording it and being able to like sit on it for a bit where 
you know, we did play some of these songs out live, but some we did just build in a practice space and then go in the studio as opposed to four minute mile where all those songs other than the one Matt was talking about that we just sort of wrote there, those it was basically just our show. And then we went mm-hmm. and recorded the show. So those those songs got worked out by just performing them as opposed to listening to them on headphones and and thinking about songs that way. I'm I'm curious because I, I don't actually know if this is the case with that song or not. And I again I haven't spent a whole lot of time with the demos because I can't fucking listen to them because the vocals are so bad. <laughs> but uh the there is a thing about how I had a a, a moleskin notebook full of lyrics and journals and stuff that got stolen out of my car at our practice space, along with a bunch of uh insulin and syringes because I'm diabetic. I so, got a bunch of hair metal cassettes stolen from my car. Yeah, but I had to kind of like <laughs> scrap some lyrics because they got stolen out of the car. And like, I think probably some of them were just the only way that I saved any of them were because they were on those demos. Um, otherwise, I wouldn't have remembered them. But I, I imagine it's just like a it's like a, you know, it. I mean, the way I write lyrics anyway is just constant revision. Um and it's it's real nitpicky. Um, I'm probably more nitpicky with lyrics than I am with any other part of of uh, the songwriting process. So it doesn't surprise me that they're they're different because I I would have like poured over them quite a bit. We've done a lot where we'll have Matt will have lyrics for one song and then use them for another song. Mm-hmm. And we've done that with parts where it, we'll, we'll have best, part, not- parts of some songs and then end up they end up on a different song. Yeah, you yeah. got to be careful because sometimes if you if you show the band an idea you have and then they start to like that idea, but you want to change it, they're like, no, I liked it better the way you had it before. They're like, no. Yeah, that's like there's like a word for that where you just get like stuck in the demo, you know, and you're so you listen to a demo too much and then you go to make the record. Yeah, yeah. I, I feel like even like as a listener, right, like when um whatever the first version of something that you hear, I think generally sticks with you, you know? So yeah, like, yeah. I, I can't think of a good example off the top of my head, but like, I know there are songs where like, I heard a live version first, or like, I actually somehow heard a demo first. And then you hear like the one on the album and you're like, it's off. Something's wrong with it. Yeah. There is a, we have a song uh, called Ann Arbor that's on. Um, so the, it's, it's listed as two different recordings, but it's actually the same, re- the same exact recording twice just one of them has piano on it so it was kind of like and, and harmonies and and harmonies and so people would be like i like the first version better it's way better than the second one i'm like well it's the same fucking song like it's literally <laughs> the same it, it's just like you could say you like it better without the piano and harmonies that would make sense but saying it's a different version no it's different different <laughs> <laughs> Um, it's also pretty fascinating listening to the acoustic demos on the new reissue. Like, I mean, especially for example, like I'll catch you, which on the demo is this acoustic guitar song. And then it becomes this piano ballad on the record. Um, Matt, when you were writing that song, did you have in the back of your head, like this should be a piano ballad or was it like a guitar song that got changed down the line? Uh, I tend to not think about it like that. I kind of, come up with like lyrics and melodies and then just sort of uh, really kind of assume that the band will sort of figure out what the arrangement of the instrumentation should be. I mean, I knew it was a ballad. I don't, Mm -hmm. I don't know that I knew what, I didn't know it was going to be a power ballad necessarily. Did you write it? Cause I don't even remember. Did you write that before James was in the band? Cause that might've affected it. I think so. Or right around the time, I mean, because he didn't really join the band until we made that record. Like he kind of came out with us. Yeah. So remember, he was a, a quote half member of the band. We, we were doing a lot when Rob, Ryan, and him were all living together in the Valentine House. That's when I was and, in Boston. Uh, I think that demo's in Boston. The I'll catch and then you me. you were in Boston at the time. Yeah. Okay. So I don't I don't know. I was just kind of writing, but I don't I don't. I don't know that I really knew what it was supposed to sound like. I think if anything, I probably would have thought that they wouldn't like that song that or out of reach would probably be the ones that would be like, you guys aren't going to like this because it's not like a rock song, you know, but, uh, uh, and they may not have, I don't remember. (laughs) May have been like something I had to, to push on them. I remember that was the case with mass Pike. Nobody liked mass Pike. 
when I first brought it in. I, I don't remember that. I do. I think I always liked it. I think this is revisionist history. <laughs> um, so what you're saying is. <laughs> um, so the album came out in late September, and then in October, you began a tour with at the drive-in. How did it seem like crowds were reacting to the new material on the tour? Good, I think. The bigger yeah, I... problem was having at the drive-in being your opening band. They're a hard <laughs> band to follow. Mm -hmm. Um, I feel like it it took off pretty quickly, like like all the legwork we had done. It was it was just it the it was a constant trajectory upward, fairly well, quick. And then then getting you know I don't know. It, it wasn't like a real big stylistic shift either. It was sort of like it wasn't like you know. It wasn't like, all right, here's the new song. And everybody goes, what? You know, right, I mean? right. I think that the whole trajectory of the album sort of had three different times. Like the first was just our legwork and all of the fans and word of mouth. And then we got some airplay on 120 minutes MTV. And then we got to be on 120 minutes. And, you know, I, I remember maybe younger people don't realize it's back at back then, like to have a video on 120 minutes was a really big deal. Like, so I found out so many bands because of that. And I, I think that kind of took us off. And then finally, we we did a tour of Green Day and Weezer near the end of the cycle. And that was like another uh, whole other thing. So, yeah. Yeah, I wanted to ask about that tour, too, because I feel like um, just from talking to bands over the years, I feel like when bands go on like a huge tour opening for a Green Day or a Weezer, it's either like, oh, this was a great opportunity for us. Or it's like we played to people who were finding their seats. Like no. how, how how was that those, for the get up? Those two, the, we've they, done those tours as well, but those mm -hmm. two tours in particular were very much like With, uh, people were open minded and receptive. It was it was family. huge. Like the Green Day tour, there was no. You'll get people saying that to us. Like there was no first band. I mean, there was there was it was just us in Green Day, mm -hmm. and uh, I think we had a lot of hype around us at the time. So yeah, that it that did really well, and then also. The the Weezer tour was insane. Like it was that's that sort of solidified everything. Uh cuz enough people there knew knew us and were singing every word and it kind of was like then other people were like how do they know who this band is? You know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. I guess yeah. I need to know who this band is too. The Weezer tour we got voted on to. Like it was like a fan response to who <laughs> they should take out and it yeah. We were the, the the odds on favorite. Uh, the Green Day tour too, also because it was before American Idiot, and so it was still, you know, like bigger shows, but like it wasn't like, you know, arenas or anything. It was like sort that. of. They were kind of. It was post. I love that. pre pre. -American. I love that album. It was on the Warning tour. I love that album, but it was kind of a style shift a little bit for them, and it, I think it was probably their like most. <laughs> worst performing album up to yeah, that and point. I think the shows were small a little bit smaller um, for them, bigger mm -hmm. for us. And so people may have been more receptive to to the whole I think the bigger the show gets the especially when it's just like the you know like it's like the headliner and then like in really small print it's the one opening band and it's just kind of like they're basically like background music for finding your seat. Mm -hmm. and, um it wasn't like that on either of those tours, the Weezer tour or the Green Day tour. The Weezer one was interesting, too, because it was before it was kind of their comeback tour before the Green album. And so people were just people were like camped out. It was insane. It was insane. Yeah, but they had to, they had to see us because they had to get, <laughs> they had to get in. Oh, uh, I mean, the, that tour. I, mean, I have so many stories from that tour. There were these girls that we heard about were like rushing to the front and wearing adult diapers so they could pee and not lose their spot to stay in the front to see the show i mean i don't there's no band i like even close to that much that i've, I've done that even back then um being that you mentioned like weezer as an early get up kids influence was that sort of like a sentimental thing to open for them mm -hmm. yeah it was it was crazy playing with bands you you looked up to you know hanging out with green day like <laughs> one night and billy joe's playing his acoustic guitar his the time of your life guitar playing beatles songs and it's just like is this real life yeah 
Um, it's uh, Matt, you mentioned following at the drive-in, not an easy task. What do you remember about seeing them play in those days? Uh, they're just, a, they were just a great, a great live band. They were just, you know, they were like sort of like organized chaos on stage. At um, that time, they were sort of not to compare us to them, but kind of like what we had just gone through with a lot of hype behind us. And like, you could see the crowds getting bigger and everything right then. I think that's the same thing was happening with them. And I definitely know, I hear from a lot of people who had no idea who they were and saw them on that tour and uh, became really big fans. But yeah, I mean, obviously they're an explosive live act. So we, uh, we, it just makes us, we had to follow this. Yeah. I mean, it just, it's like, you, you, you know, it's, I, I'm sure we jumped around a bit more and played a little <laughs> bit faster on that tour just because of the, you know, these young whippersnappers coming up before. <laughs> totally. Um, so something I've always found interesting is like, so by the end of the nineties, it kind of seemed like a lot of the emo stuff was dying down. Like a lot of bands were breaking up like braid mineral, Texas, the reason knapsack, Jimmy Eat world were dropped by capital. Nobody really had a true breakthrough hit. And then, of course, fast forward to 2001, Jimmy Eat World has the middle and you start seeing like Dashboard Saves the Day Thursday. And like now all of a sudden this music is mainstream music. Um, and a lot of the younger bands that were really kind of skyrocketing from the basement to MTV, a lot of them were name dropping something right home of something at home about as like a formative influence for them. So my question here is like, with that album being sort of like considered this thing that helped kickstart this newer wave of now mainstream popular emo. Did you feel that momentum building in like late 99, 2000, early 01, or did it take you by surprise when all of a sudden emo was mainstream music? A little uh, bit by um, surprise. I mean, it's interesting when you, when you think, when I think back on that, because we were really only concerned with what we were doing mm -hmm. and all the questions that we get about this time are kind of about the scene as a whole. And other than like being friends with people and listening to other bands, we weren't really that concerned about what was going on with anybody other than ourselves because, you know, we're, we're not in the emo, we're just in the get up kids business. That's it. So it, it wasn't, you know, it, we definitely noticed things getting bigger, you know, and then like, you know, Jimmy Eat world, the fact that clarity wasn't a huge hit was baffling to all of us because we're just like, and then that band just willed their success into existence. Is just, is Lucky Denver? The, I, yeah, that's on Clarity. Okay, okay. I, we were just. I was. I was at a bar. My friend was bartending. This was just a few days ago, and he played that song. And I remember telling him, "It's like you know, it's crazy. This song wasn't a big hit. And I bet if they would have put it on, uh, Bleed American, or well, is that, that is it called that, that again? Like I bet yeah. it would have been a hit." <laughs> After the middle, if they, they then would have re-released it, it would have been huge. What's you know? the song that's the, are you listening? Yeah, the Sweetness. That was yeah. on Clarity. Like, we knew it that. Was? It no, was? it's the, not. It's not on the record, but, but they, they were, recorded it for it. Yeah. They recorded or it the for Clarity, and it didn't make it on the record. Or they had already printed the record or something like that. And it was just sort of like, that song's a fucking hit, dude. Like, you know. It probably wouldn't have been, though, if then if it, oh, if it, it was on Clarity. Not yeah. a fucking Lucky yeah. Denver Mint had but it. that's but that goes back to what you started this entire conversation with about the right place at the right time. Like so much, like if something right home about <laughs> the exact sounding record would have been put out two years later, would it have been on the radio? Would it have been a gold record? You know, I don't know. But then you're getting into like. You know, I don't know. It's just, it's all like, what ifs? I'm not unhappy with the success that we had or that like our friends had. So it's just sort of, it just, you know, you did notice things getting bigger. And then around the time that we started kind of not being in that scene anymore is sort of when like kind of post nine 11, like all the, is when the real like money started flowing in and then watching the dashboard thing happen was kind of wild just because that was sort of, uh, kind of a phenomenon you know people singing louder than him yeah the, the anniversary toured with chris kind of right like i think dashwood was opening for them right about 
the time he was going up and you could just you you same kind of thing you kind of just see it happening right in front of your eyes well that's what uh jim wilbur from super chunk when they played with us he was like how about that the first time we met him he's like how about that dashboard kid and we're like yeah he's a friend and he's like he's gonna eat your lunch <laughs> but he said I'm like all right thanks man because it's all competition yep <laughs> it's not uh but yeah i mean that 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 scene i mean it, it we never intended to be anything other than a like a pop band so you know if it hadn't been for all that damn new metal we maybe would have been on the radio <laughs> thanks dirts <laughs> um and yeah i mean i totally get like you know it's easy for someone like me to like want to talk about like the scene that's like these bigger narratives. And then I get like, you're in the band and you're like, we're just doing our band. I also get not loving the word emo. Um, and I know that it's something I think that you care less about now, but in the past have been more critical about. Um, and then that's like, dumb word. yeah, I mean, <laughs> um, I, go ahead. Sorry. Oh, no, I was just thinking at that time, I it's like we were part of a scene. And mm -hmm. you said it yourself, all these bands, Braid was breaking up, all these, the bands that we grew up, like toured with and grew up with were all ending. And it sort of felt like about that time when we were starting to like write on a wire and we were kind of, I don't want to say outgrowing the scene, but we were growing up and it wasn't, the, it just wasn't the same. It was turning into that scene that you're talking about. We're sort of like, we have like one foot in there and one foot over here. And we were sort of like starting to, to just it just wasn't the same scene we grew up in. It was kind of create like I don't want to say emo version three or whatever, third wave or something. But it was, it, we were sort of like uh, <laughs> the Oregon Trail generation of, of emo, where it's like in between both worlds, kind of. Yeah. If yeah. That, I, that there's a reference for you. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, totally. Yeah, and I mean, um, and I did want to ask too, like when you did on a wire, which was obviously so different than something to write home about. Did that have to, were you reacting to what was happening like in the mainstream or were you more reacting to something internally? Like we are just growing mm -hmm. as songwriters and I think this is just what we do now. Both? I think both. I don't think it was like totally like, screw all this, we're gonna, we're gonna change. It's just, you know, three years had passed from the time of those two records. And I think we just were touring so much, we didn't get to make the record that came in between. And I think there could have been a transition uh, record that wouldn't have made it. So, do you, would you agree with that, Matt? Like, it, like I never really thought about it before. Well, it's uh, just it was a long time. Like, like we were gonna we were done touring, and then we got the Weezer tour and the Green Day tour, and it just I felt like there was a whole another year tour cycle that we weren't gonna do. We were like ready to make a new record, and if we would have started sooner, maybe we were. It, it just I don't. It might have been a a more gradual transition yeah, I mean, as to, as opposed to something. So there is a level night and day of, different, a level of burnout from what we had been doing with Sunray at home about in that tour that maybe we were just so dead set on doing something uh, that didn't feel that weird to us, but um, as an outsider looking in could see it would be kind of a culture shock, I think. But um, yeah, I never really thought about that. Before. That's an interesting thought experiment. I don't know what that would have been, what that would have been like. Yeah. Yeah. Also, I, a lot, if you influence a lot of bands, everything starts kind of sounding one way. So it just overall in the mainstream and it sort of, maybe it made us, you know, I don't want to give like a middle finger to everything, like, but. Well, and then like our. Just try already... to find our, an, another thing that for, for ourselves, I don't, I don't know. I think our songwriting had become a bit formulaic too, where it was just sort of like, like I remember going into wire and being like, okay, no halftime, no octave chords. Like let's, you know, I think some things come no, for a no, we you, we you Moog stuff. Like it becomes for a lake when other people take what you've done and then it becomes this thing. And then it like, and then it just gets regurgitated and regurgitated. I'm just saying independently, you know, of anybody yeah. else doing it, just like we we wanted to try something different. Yeah. We we were listening to a lot of different stuff at that point that we weren't listening to three years before, you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, and again, like I sort of said, like I know you 
like I forget the exact interview. I could pull it up, but we'll paraphrase. I know there was like something where it was like the Get Up Kids apologized for emo. This was like yeah, years ago. I, like I, yeah, that was so, Jim. Jim. Yeah. <laughs> so I've I'm this is gonna be on my gravestone, you know. <laughs> it, the the funny thing about that whole thing is that I first of all, I didn't <laughs> I was trying to make fun of ourselves. I was mm. actually trying to make fun of us, like saying uh, we weren't that good, you know, and being sort of self-deprecating. It, it was not taken that way, nor did nor did I say. I, it was more about the scene and what the scene had become and trying to say that it's just not where we came from. It's something completely different. You know, at the end of the day, if our band influenced you to pick up a guitar and start a band, even if I think it's terrible or I think it's awesome or whatever, it's art, it's subjective. That's awesome. That's that. That's I think that's cool. That's all I have to say about all that. <laughs> did you like did you have a moment ever where you were like, um, like, obviously, in that in that moment, you were feeling something. Did you kind of like maybe years down the line, warm up to even like your feelings on what the scene had like did you know what yeah. I'm saying? So that quote, the, the quote came from we had just played Bamboozle Festival. And it just, I think we just felt like fish out of water. Mm -hmm. And and that's really what that came from. Like, I don't see how we, I, I couldn't see at the time how we fit into all of this. Uh, yeah, it's, I don't know. <laughs> we just, I just didn't feel like, like we fit in. That's where that came from. And I like, yeah, it, you can look back on it now and like anything and yeah regrets whatever i guess i just shouldn't have said anything <laughs> <That's not laughs> probably... yeah so when did it really start to click for you that something to write home about had become such an important album for so many people like the kind of thing that you would do a 10th anniversary 20th and now 25th anniversary celebration for um when did it sort of click with you that that had become that and also um tell me about like you personally kind of embracing like, oh, we made this thing that people see this way. Uh, well, we didn't do anything for the 20th anniversary of it because we had put out a record called Problems that same year. So we decided to focus on that. And we were just like, well, we'll do something for the 25th, which mm -hmm. is what we're now doing. Uh, the 10th anniversary we used as an excuse to get the band back together. Um, so that was kind of why we did that. Uh, I don't know. Like, I don't, I don't dislike the record. I'm glad people like it, but, um, you know, I, I've been, I've been kind of saying lately that like the, the, what we, at least for me, what I really get out of this record and performing it is how people react to it. Like it's a, it's a way more fun record to perform than it is to rehearse. Like rehearsing it is sort of like, okay, we know these songs. Like even yesterday when we were rehearsing, it's like, okay, we don't need to play that one. We know that one, fine. Mm -hmm. And But when you're playing it in front of however many people that are singing along to it, you start to kind of like feed off of that energy. And that feels really, really good. So like the songs in and of themselves, we've, re we've played them so many times that it's hard for them to like not lose some sense of meaning a little bit uh and so you have to really try to connect with the the audience at least for me and so you know that we've ju we've just made a couple of videos for uh holiday and we they have a new one for uh, 10 minutes coming out and it's the same kind of thing where it's uh video footage from back then all sort of spliced together and i hadn't been real sentimental about any of this uh at all i've just been like all right we gotta relearn these songs and you know go out there and, and and do the job and uh i was just watching the one for 10 minutes that our friend josh berwanger just put together he uh, plays in the anniversary and it was kind of surreal like really i was really thinking about what like as dustin who's playing keyboards with us now was saying like watching you know five years of your life in three minutes flash before your eyes and yeah i I'm going to I'm going to think about that when I'm playing those songs to get to get me in that in that mindset, because I think when you're in the thick of it, you just you don't have time to. I don't know, I don't. Being 
with like nostalgia can be a, 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 a dangerous thing, right? When you're, cause you can just get stuck in it. And I think, you don't want to be at, uncle, at, you don't want to be uncle rico yeah Always you know dynamite. and we've all we've always been good on tour where it's like we play the old songs but we play the new songs but yeah you don't want to be uncle rico but i think at where i'm at now in my life i'm okay i'm okay with nostalgia on like if the only reason you like our band is because of this record and the only reason you're going to come and see our band is because of these songs well i'm glad that that you know what that's enough for me it's like I was saying this in another interview, like bands that were one hit wonders and like, oh, they were just a one hit wonder. And I'll tell you, most bands would be happy to be a one hit wonder because most fans don't have any hits. Right. So just. I don't just to be a band that released an album that people still care about 25 years later is a pretty big accomplishment in my book. I agree with that. So the upcoming tour is with the Smoking Popes. Are you longtime fans or friends or both? Uh, I don't. Like, I've never I don't, met Yeah, I'm excited. I love the Smoking Popes. We, are, we have friends in common. We when have they, friends. Yeah. When they agreed to do the tour, we were all very, very excited. I think they're they're a kind of a perfect perfect band to go out with for this record. Any uh, surprises in store for the tour besides playing the album in full? We're gonna play a lot of songs of that so. era that aren't on the album. We're gonna uh, do the thing in the nude. Yeah. <laughs> right. Uh, so yeah, so there's going to be a, it's going to be a lot of uh, a lot of songs of that of that era. Yeah. Awesome. I, I mean, I don't think it's a surprise. You know, I will say this though. Uh when we did the 4 minute mile 25th anniversary tour, there was something it wasn't like I just kind of thought of it as like an, another tour just with different songs and the reaction of the crowd was different. It was like way more intense than usual and i'm kind of curious to see if this ends up being even more so uh it's i can't i can't put my finger on it maybe by the end of this tour i'll be able to explain what it is but there's just something the energy is different and i think with this record in particular because it represents a time in people's life that you know for an hour and a half every night they can go back to uh you know, you get you get a different reaction out of people than if you're just playing a show, just a regular ass, you know, Saturday Al night. Albums that are, you know, when you're young, they sort of imprint on you. It's like a baby duckling seeing their mom for the first time. <laughs> like, I mean, I'm still that guy. I still listen to records from 1998 front to back all the time, you know. So uh, I expect some some intensity that maybe there'll be some more people getting engaged when we play i'll catch you at you the show Matt. <laughs> take nothing away from this it's the quote that something at home about is the baby duckling of emo <laughs> i mean I, I i definitely think you know there's just something to seeing an album performed in the order you're familiar with like when you feel the next song coming before hey, it even starts and, he, and, and, and that fucking told you that was a debate like, that, that that well no the debate was because the first songs of the album are the hardest for Matt to sing. So it's basically going out doing that. So, you know, and we, we, we opened a few shows of, for the jawbreaker dear you, you tour and they did not play it in order. They, they played the whole record. They just didn't do it in order. And Matt was very adamant about, we, we got to play it front to back. And I know what you're saying. There's certain songs I've done like, like Spotify random. And it's like, you're so used to hearing that next song next that. You know, it'd also be, be nice. Yes. If don't have to fucking argue about the set list never <laughs> it's such a big argument every every it's like do we have when we add three more songs like no so no offense to anyone who does this but i get very upset when it's an album tour and they change the order up or play it in reverse like i saw metallica do ride the lightning in reverse and i'm like i mean you can't complain about the song choices but come on start to finish okay I mean, if the only reason to not do this record in order is because the first two songs are hard to sing. I'll just well, to and also I, I I'm think warming up holiday <laughs> back with action and action is is like a such a good one two punch. It it sets the tone of the of the evening pretty well. It's interesting, though, because it doesn't flow the way we would write a set list normally. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? Like it kind of like. Like it goes like rock, rock, ballad, rock, ballad. Like it just kind of it doesn't like go 
it just kind of like peaks and bed. It's like it's written like a record sequence, not like a show sequence. So just kind of interesting that we've been closing with 10 minutes for like 20 years. And now it's in the middle. It is the- weird. It's it's weird. It's in the middle of the set. <laughs> we that- thought about maybe playing it again at the end. <laughs> like like a. Uh, but like yeah. the bands back in the day and they'd, have oh, like, it. they'd they, open and close it's our single so they, they'd start it and end it that's definitely one i always think about this too like when you go see an album in full and it's just got like everyone here loves the record that's why they're here but there's that one song that's way more of a hit and it's like track three and you're yeah. like you know because you've seen people leave a show after a hit song if they play it an hour into an hour and a half set but if you're playing it 10 minutes into an hour and a half set. Yeah. I'm always like, are people staying for sure? That's luckily, all... luckily yeah, half, half the crowd probably either got engaged or walked down the aisle to I'll catch you. So they'll there you go. stay for that one. I'm going to, I'll make a note of when it looks like people are going to grab a beer. at what part <laughs> of the set. <laughs> I can tell you it's at the beginning of side two. We'll see. Um, well, I'm excited. I saw the four minute mile tour at Riot Fest um right so on. uh and hopefully i'll be at this one and um if all goes according to plan i can't imagine myself leaving to get a beer during any of the songs okay uh, so- well we'll do you know what we should do we'll we'll just take an extra long break during the encore that way no one has to miss anything. <laughs> um so anything else that you want to add before we go uh, uh we, thank we, you uh, just- sorry i had a, a brain free i have a terrible headache so I'm sorry. I had I've had a, a mental block a few times during this interview. I would say if you could mention that there are more tour dates coming in 2025 that we haven't announced yet. So please stop bothering us about that we are coming to your town because we're tr- we're trying to get there. But we one of the most frustrating things on social media is when you're posting things and they're like. Like, I so swear I saw someone say, I mean, if you guys were doing this for four minute mile, I'd be there. <laughs> it's like, I saw one when the. Like, so I don't know what to tell you, man. I don't know what to tell you. one when the polyvinyl reissue got announced. They're like, oh, man, I hope they do a tour for this record. <laughs> announced the tour like two months ago. Oh, I mean, I get it. I'm old. It's like, I'm so many times I find out three days after the fact that my, to Philly. my favorite band just played, you know. We're coming back to Philly. We were in Philly yesterday. That's yeah. Come yeah. to Brazil. We are. I, it's like it's a on. And a half. Well, if you listened this far, there is a reissue and a tour. Don't miss either one of them. More day and more dates next year. So we we want we want we want to come see you as much yes. as you want. If you if you live anywhere near Atlanta or Florida or anywhere around there, we are coming to you. Just and Europe. Wait and, and Europe and hopefully Australia and Japan. Yeah. and other places around the world actually one more question um yeah. any nope. <laughs> any idea when you might be writing another record or uh, if nothing nothing on the books right now so we we're, we're just focusing on this we worked on a bunch of stuff during covid some good some okay and now we're just focused on this yeah got it All right. Well, thanks so much, guys. Yeah, man. Thank you. Hey, thanks for listening. Once again, the Get Up Kids are playing Something to Write Home About in full on tour this year. And if you don't see your city listed, they have more dates being announced in 2025. So stay tuned. The deluxe reissue is coming out this summer via polyvinyl. And again, there's an exclusive violet and silver mix vinyl variant available in the online Brooklyn Vegan store. And you can click the link for that in the description of this episode. If you like what you heard, give us a good rating, like, subscribe, tell your friends about us. That little stuff goes a long way and we really appreciate it. And uh, thanks again. See you next time.